Well, welcome to episode seven of the Hunt and Lamb Man podcast. This is the Hunt and Lamb Man, and we got a special treat. We got Ryan, old Ryan Wascom. Not that he's old, but you know, we got new Ryan behind the camera. And uh, we're doing something a little bit different today. Of course, it is turkey season, and before we get too far into this, we want to thank Southern Ag Credit for being our title sponsor. They take such good care of us and our clients. They take care of me and Ryan here uh, as we do our different projects, which we're going to talk about today on the podcast. So today's podcast is the Missouri Project. Before we get into that, we're going to get a little turkey season update. Um, every, every one of my friends is going to laugh because my update is... I'm on 30 jakes, and I'm telling you, I don't know if I've ever been this much and been this whipped. Now, I will say when Cub is not here, I have not, you know, I'll go for an hour and a half in the morning if they don't want to act right, I just ease on to work, but the weather this week when Cub has been here has been killing us, and uh, it's just been tough. What do you think? Ryan kills one every time he goes. <laughs> no, it, it doesn't work like that, but yeah, it's been a, a terrible week, and honestly, I mean, we've only had a very few good days. The opening week of Mississippi, uh, the weather was terrible. Um, you know, we've had the the mornings that I've killed have been have been really good. The weather was cool, everything worked out good like that. But yeah, everybody's kind of wondering when the Huntland man's gonna tag out. Well, I'm wondering that <laughs> myself. I'm feeling bad because my little girl Asa, you know, every day you get a turkey daddy, you get a turkey daddy, and I mean. I've been having to let my little girl down a lot. I know what you mean. I know what you mean. They get excited when you bring them in. But you know, I, I've been, of course, you get frustrated because you want to kill one, but I've had such a good time going this year. I've been on turkeys a lot, and uh, we've had a lot of turkeys this year, had a lot of Jake problems, and uh, you know, hey, I get to go a lot, so I'm going to be thankful for how much I get to go. Um, everybody watching and listening, you know, Ryan, of course, Trained Assassin Television, we've been uh, doing hunting shows and hunting together even before that, so I don't know, 10, 12 years now. Um, Ryan went to school with Craig Fitz at Oak Forest, and that's kind of how we all met him and his brother Rusty to get, go way back and been on what, Jay Leno and Letterman uh, with their turkey hunting abilities. Yeah, yeah, we went to, on Jay Leno, I went to Letterman, uh, and they picked, they sent five of us up there, and they picked three. And me and the boy that actually won the turkey calling contest, he didn't make it. So we, uh, both of us, we were the youngest, and we wasn't able to be on the show. They picked the three oldest. Oh. So it was one of them deals, man. We flew up there that morning, went to the set, flew back the next day. That was at Letterman. Now, Leno, we stayed out there a week. Universal Studios, uh, I forget where all we went, but... Everything was first class. Limousines, that's the first time I ever rode in a limousine. I was, oh, so a crazy bird doesn't come to town. Yeah, because you're coming to town there. But yeah, we had a we had a good time doing that. And uh, just, you know, turkey hunting's taken us a lot of places. A lot of places. Well, it's taken Ryan and I a lot of places. It's, it's really cool to look back at life and see how you got to each place. If you see right now, speaking of each place, Ryan, has his camouflage on. Cub and I hunted this morning, and him and Cub are going to hunt this afternoon. We got the morning lack of yeah. gobbling, and they got the good weather for this afternoon, so hopefully they can get it done. Yeah, y'all didn't have a very good morning. Last night, we probably got, I'm hearing reports, four or five inches of rain in our right. area. And it's been like that all week. It's been a terrible week of weather, and the sun is actually poked out right now, and it's shining. So we got to finish this thing up. Cub and I, we got to go get a gobbler on the ground. Well, you heard the man. He said, let's finish <laughs> this thing up. All right, the Missouri Project. Let me tell you all about the Missouri Project. And this is a going to be a really cool podcast because I think it enlightens people about, uh, about buying land in places that you're not necessarily from or you're comfortable with. So Ryan and I uh, have been hunting. Uh-oh, there goes my cell phone. Somebody calling me, trying to buy some land. Sorry about that. Um... Ryan and I have been hunting in the Midwest for 10, 12 years, at least, actually, a lot longer than that. But we've been, uh, Ryan and I, I guess four years ago, we started leasing land together in the Midwest. Just, we realized that, you know, we were hunting with outfitters and with friends and on random places. And we quickly realized that if we ran our cameras and we planted our food plots and we made the game plans, we killed more deer. Absolutely, you know, and <clears throat> you can... We did what we wanted to do. There's a lot of times when we went to places, you know, obviously we thought, you know, maybe should have done something different, hang the stand in a different spot, plant a food plot in a different spot, 
um, you know, access and just everything that we've learned over our, I guess, here in the South in our years of, of knowledge, you know, just things wasn't going like we wanted to, and we were spending X amount of dollars. The doing same that. money it would cost to lease it. to lease a place, mm -hmm. and so anyway, we decided to lease a place, and it's been the best thing we ever did. Oh yeah, and it, it's really cool where it's taken us. So, uh, so just kind of keep you up to speed. So Ryan and I decided to start leasing a place. We leased that place north of Bethany, Missouri, in Harrison County, and uh, was an awesome place. Um, we leased it for two years. Uh, I killed a big kind of a cold deer, big mature deer down the road. Ryan killed a um, 153. Three, the and, first year. And almost killed a 160. Almost, almost. Uh, yep, that was a, that was the first big deer we got on cam and almost got yep. him killed. But uh, then the next year I killed a big 143 inch eight point and Ryan killed a 167. Killed a bunch of turkeys. Uh, Uncle Rusty actually shot the head off. OFT off <laughs> of a turkey on that farm. The first 10 minutes of daylight I was ever on that farm. Yeah. But, um, you know, we learned a lot from that farm and learned what to do and what not to do. And I heard Ryan say it uh, a couple weeks ago. He said, man, we had that farm dialed in. And that was just a lease. Uh, since that time, my parents have actually uh, started investing in northern Missouri in hunting ground and been doing it for about three or four years now. And of course, doing what I do for a living, uh, you know, every deal, not that they have to, but they pass every deal by, by me, hey, what do you think, Slade? And, and we've just learned that market from being up there. And I say all that to say these same things our clients, Ryan's a real tree land pro like myself, you know, if you're not familiar with Southwest Mississippi or the Felician or Tangerine Hill, you name it, you can learn just like we learned. A lot of people listen to this podcast, either hunt with a friend up here or hunt uh, on a lease in this area or, or, or whatever the case may be. We learn just like we're asking you to learn. You, before, let's say you're not ready to go to buy land for three, five, ten years. Start learning now. Get on our email list. Uh, we send out about two emails a month and start paying attention to what things are leasing for, what things are selling for, why some things are worth more. Listen to this podcast is exactly what we're talking about. And so, you know, it's a really cool perspective Ryan and I have of buying property up there the same way we're asking people to buy up here. Um, Ryan, tell me this, uh, and I, I'll get to, of course, our first buy, but what attracted you to North Central and North East Missouri? So, growing up, I mean, I, I turkey hunted in Missouri, I deer hunted in Missouri from 9, 10, 11 years old all the time. And the thing up there, one is just the scenery. I mean, it's beautiful. Then they have a lot of deer, a lot of turkeys. The wildlife is there. Big timber. Uh, hardwoods, creek, everything you could want along with all the crops. They got what it takes to grow big deer. And then, you know, the biggest thing is uh, basically just honestly the big deer. You want to go, you can't kill a 150 inch deer if you're not hunting where 150, 150 inch deer are. So here at the house we're hunting 120s, 130, five if we're lucky every once in a while we'll you know scratch one up 140 and then once in a blue moon you might see one 150 just and, and ryan did kill one 150 one yeah day. it just depends on where you're hunting at so but i mean that's what really drew me to that area there and it's just it's a great investment great investment area the the property up there is just unreal it really is it's a beautiful area so uh so Ryan and I, you know, we're getting to be old fellas now, I guess. You know, we're both in our mid-30s. <clears throat> and last year, uh, we've got a lot of, we developed a lot of friendships with farmers, other hunters, real estate agents, and, and things. And and last year, uh, Ryan and I had something come across. Basically, it came across my desk first. Hey, there was a property that came up for sale that we thought was a pretty good deal. And we were really thinking we were a couple years out from doing something like this. We had toyed with the idea, but... You know, whenever, basically I told Ryan, Ryan, you're going to be hunting with me anyway. Why don't you, you know, why don't you just come in and we'll, we'll form a little land company and we'll start buying property up there. 
basically because a lot of this property up there like our our area you know you can you can make money with timber and you can up there but most of the money up there up there is made with crp or farm income or something like that i said we figured it up and what it would cost us to own that place every year you know with, as far as interest rates and things like that was the same price we would lease it for exactly so it's a no-brainer Exactly. Um, interest rates are low. Southern Ag Credit, um, they helped us finance that place way up there. So Ryan and I bought our first farm. We actually leased a farm right down the road, a different lease, right down the road. I flew up there, and this is an interesting part of the story. I flew up there, Ryan couldn't go, and looked at the farm for literally an hour and a half, two hours. Um, checked the landowner's trail cameras, which I got in trouble for, but hey, we bought the property, so it wasn't <laughs> matter. But, uh, so Ryan put up his money with a lot of faith in me and uh, he knows how tight I am so he knows I wouldn't have bought it unless it was a good deal. So Ryan, you bought this property sight and scene. Tell me what that's about and how'd you talk your wife into that? So Slate, he says, look, we gotta go up here this day. I said, okay. Well, I had gotten sick and with COVID and everything going on, didn't know what was, you know, I said, look, it's best I don't go. I'm putting all my faith in you. I'll take, you're taking my money make sure this is the great investment so anyway slave went and looked at it and he called me he said man he said we got to get it uh my wife she really didn't uh carla really didn't have any you know negative things to say she says i trust slave slave knows land and he's gonna make a good investment if we need if that's what it's gonna be and uh once i laid eyes on it it was the best thing we did and it's funny because Lori, my wife, she'll listen to this and she'll be giggling in her car. So Lori, for some reason, and this is the first time she's ever done this, and, and you know, people call me tight or whatever, she thought for some reason it was just like I was going to buy a brand new bass boat or a Corvette or sports car or something like that. She just thought that Ryan and I were spending this money because we wanted to place in Missouri. And there was some truth to that because of course we wanted to place in Missouri. You know, there's something to be said about investing and working things you have passion about so so of course we wanted a place and you know if if, if this investment let's say makes 85 percent and another investment make 100 percent i'm 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 by the land just because i get it i trust it and there's something to be said for doing things that you know and we definitely know land you know, like i said ryan's a real tree land pro like myself and so uh, we bought the place uh, in October. Yes. Um, in October, I was looking at the paperwork yesterday, and uh, it's funny. Uh, Ryan rode up there the day before me. We both went up there the first week. The of first November. week in November. First week in November, and we hunted on the lease down the road in that place. And uh, the first time Ryan saw it, uh, you know, he was getting ready to go hunting on it. And we had some good deer on camera. The neighbor who we knew. It's a real funny story. So the neighbor to the west was from Baton Rouge, east, and the neighbor to the north was from Baton Rouge. It was like I was hunting in That's right. southwest Mississippi. That's all exactly right. But, um, you know, <clears throat> the pro property really was a really cool property. And our, our plan, um, you know, and Ryan, you correct me if, if, if I'm wrong anywhere. Our plan was this place came out of CRP in about two and a half years. We were going to cut some timber, really deer it up real good, put some money back in our pocket with the timber, fix up the camp a little bit, and uh, then, you know, enjoy it for a couple of years, take pictures on it, get inventory, really, you know, anytime somebody's, like our last farm, for instance, our last farm that we leased, when the realtor that we used up there got ready to sell it, I sent him like three or four episodes we filmed yeah. out there, all the big deer we killed, the pictures, I sent the client, actually the client called me, and he just told me, he said, just call us away. I sent him the pictures, okay, these are the deer you let go, these are the deer that made it, this is what you need to do to kill those deer. I mean, just laid it out for me, and, and somebody could trust, hey, I'm watching them kill these big deer on video out there, of course I want this place, and that's what we wanted to do with our, uh, with our farm over there. Um, I remember the first morning, I sat in a tree over there, I was sitting in a tree at daylight, and I was right in between three groups of turkeys roosting. And I was like, oh yeah, oh, yeah. we've bought us a fall. It's so. a good one. And um, so uh, the plan was, you know, after a couple of years, we're gonna take it out of CRP, cut that timber, really deer it up, get some more food on it and uh, and, and sell it and uh, possibly move on to a bigger farm. So Ryan, I'll let you kind of take it from there. Okay, how did we get to where we are now as okay. far as, um, you know, of course the farm is selling at the end of the month. Right. Go ahead. 
So like Slade said, it was a, uh, it's a very beautiful farm. It was wide open. The, uh, the timber was, I mean, it was just very, very wide open. <coughs> but so anyway, the, as far as cover, we didn't have a lot of cover. So we got with the local logger and told him, said, look, we need to, you know, thicken up a couple of these areas, make it better. Because once we get cover here, when we put the food in here, it's going to be on. And so anyway, you know, we're all set up. We start hanging stands and whatnot, hunting, seeing deer. Uh, of course, the big deer were locked down at the time. And, you know, really learning the place. And we didn't have any food on this place. One little food plot, uh, the neighbor had come in and put it in there for us. And so anyway, we hunted and hunted and didn't see the, the big deer that we were after. Now, fast forward, you know, we go through that week there and we don't kill anything and, and we elect not to go back late season just because we didn't have the food. Like I say, it's late, like we talked earlier, we closed on the place October the 11th or 20th, so yeah, right, I mean, it was right, late, yeah, right late middle, October. Middle October, and then we, the first time Rod saw it, two weeks later, we're up there hunting. Yeah, we were there hunting. So anyway, we, we did that. We were going to fix up the camp a little bit, just like Slade mentioned, and put food on the place and really make it a deer heaven. I mean, that's what it was going to be. And so the place, we hadn't even planned on selling it, you know, at the time. You know, it was for sale, but it wasn't for yeah, sale. We, we weren't marketing it or right. anything like that. Right, right. And uh, so anyway, uh, guy calls and he's ready. He said, I got a guy wanting to make an offer on it. I'm like, okay. So anyway, they go through numbers and stuff and he got to where we needed to be. And so that brings us to where we're at now. Here at the end of the month, we are going up to close on this property and turn over into the new one that we were going to purchase. Right, and so the farm we're selling is in over uh, by Mile in Sullivan County. Great farm, great area. Uh, my parents actually own a, a bunch of ground up there. <clears throat> and really cool, the farm that we're buying, Ryan and I, back again, we have not seen this property yet. Uh, our realtor up there, um, another guy with United Country that's a good friend of ours has some property right there knows the ground good and then my dad actually um, he went and looked at it also and, he, and we just all agreed that this was a property we needed to get so uh, it's actually I think I figured it up five or six miles south of where our original lease was so yes. really cool that we already knew that area um, knew some of the local guys right there. Just, just a good area. Got a really good Mexican restaurant. Oh yeah, absolutely. And, and you know that's what makes a place like that attractable. Uh, you got the town life and stuff is not too far away. You know, 10, 15 minutes from there, you can go in and get you a good place or a good meal and stuff. And then you know the the biggest thing is we know the area there, and you talking about you know never seeing this property and buying it. Most people, I mean, you're not. There's very few few people that doesn't look at a vehicle. Mm -hmm. With you know, they they want to go look before they buy it, and we're buying land, you know. And like I say, the two purchases we're we're going to do up there, I've never seen either one of them until we got on it. And so I'm actually I've got Onyx pulled up. You know, they're one of our sponsors, and I've got them pulled up on my computer right now. I'm looking at Walnut Hills, the ranch we're buying, and. <laughs> I feel so comfortable with it because this is what I do all day, every day. Look at maps. I've been right here in this area. We've probably driven past this farm before. Um, I know the landowner two two farms to the uh, west, and and I just we we've been watching what's selling up there. Really pay attention to that market, just like I'm telling everybody. Any market you're in anywhere in America you can watch that market and get comfortable with prices and what land and why land's doing that. You just got to do a little research. Pay attention. Get on it. people's email list. Uh, follow these real estate companies on social media. I'm constantly, like when somebody posts something sold in northern Missouri up there, I'm clicking on, okay, how much is sell for yeah. stuff like that. And, and then it made me comfortable with our purchase up there. So um, let's talk a little bit about the property we're buying and what makes uh what makes it i tell you one thing's excited i hadn't seen it yet so I... <laughs> yeah i mean you know we haven't actually laid eyes on it but that's the whole issue or not issue but that's the whole thing with you know 
learning to trust your agent. Mm -hmm. You know, that's good. You know what I mean? So if your agent is telling you, say, hey, look, this is a good buy, you really need to, you know, pursue this. Mm -hmm. And, and I mean, that's what we did, you know, and it's going to turn out, it's going to be a great, great place. I'm excited about it because it's got somewhere to stay on it. Yeah, and it, it really, really is because we've stayed when we were staying in that area. We we're staying at the Super Eight right there, which was by the Mexican restaurant, and it's still only a couple miles away. But so our farm we're buying up there is 360 acres. It's mostly uh, CRP. Uh, it's got a metal building home on it and a big shop. Where actually, it's really kind of a cool <clears throat> deal. Our um, the guy we're buying it from is just really walking away. Yeah. Uh, we get sheets. Towels. <laughs> uh, I don't need his toothbrush, but uh, he may be leaving that. Well, but we got a, a tire changer, a, tra a tractors, four wheelers. I mean, literal. I mean, he's not exaggerating. Chainsaws, rakes. Yeah, every anything. I mean, it's turnkey, ready to go as far as moving in. Mm -hmm. And now, as far as hunting, you know, once we get there, we we're we've been playing on the Onyx, lining out where we want to put our food plots, all that, reading the topography and stuff, and. I mean, once we get there, we'll know a whole lot more, but everything is there waiting on us. Right, and, and I feel so good from a, of course, I, I wouldn't be buying if I didn't think this was a really good investment, but from a hunting standpoint, I feel great for this fall. So the plan is we're going to go close at the end of the month, uh, get all our stuff off all the leaves. We may turkey hunt a little yeah, bit while yeah. we're up there. But, um, of course, and go move all our stuff to the new place. I've got to hurry up, and I'm a little nervous because I've got a baby going to be here in a month, and i got to run up here and do this. And it really is something we have to do because we've got to move stuff from one to the other, and I may fly back a little faster than the other crew. We'll see. But Ryan's actually already bought our uh, corn seed. Yes. We're going to uh, plant some corn either when we're up there on on another trip, and uh, we're stepping up the food plot game. So it seems like every year we've stepped up a food plot game we um the last time the last year we had our lease just north of there man we had some big old backwood rapes and turnips and sugar beets yes. and it made all the difference in the world huge difference i mean we were drawing deer from i mean and we didn't really have a big area to draw from but right. every deer around there we were drawing it into that area and this here the new farm is it's going to even be better i mean there's huge blocks of timber all around and we're gonna, once we get our food there, it's gonna be dialed in. And so, you know, in the Midwest, there's a, and anywhere, I guess, there's a lot of different ways you can hunt. And, and you know, you set up your place how you hunt. Ryan and I are extremely low pressure, uh, only go in when it's right. We had stands on our old lease just north of there, you know, that, that either only got hunted on the north wind once the first week of November got there, you know. Yeah. So we really heavily rely on our uh, trail cameras. You know, we're going to stick a couple coverts up there, uh, cell cameras, so we know what's going on while we're going uh, on these food plots and things like that. And it's so, you know, so we're going to have five or six food plots. And the plan, we're stepping up the game, is we're going to have about 10 to 12 acres. So we've got... 230 acres of CRP, and you can do 10% wildlife food plots, so say 23 acres of food plots. We're going to do 10 to 12 acres in corn, and then every spot's going to have grain, corn, and then we'll go back up in last week of July, first week of August, and put our backwood, rape, and turnips, and, and that sort of thing in. And so every spot's going to have any, if the deer hitting the greens, we're That's going right. to have it. If they're hitting the grain, We've got a tractor up there, as we said, the farmer who we're buying it from left a lot of stuff. We got a tractor and a big bush hog, so we'll go mow corn up there, have fresh mowed corn. We gotta put our cell cams on it, watch it from afar. I'm excited about that new Laura system with covert because we can stick the base up on the hill by the camp and be able to run cameras all over the place. So that's gonna be really cool to yes. check out. And uh, like Ryan said, I think this farm is even more important to, from a drawing standpoint. So at our old farm, I don't figure it out, but I mean, there was only probably two or 300 acres of woods that we connected to. Right. Um, on the east side of the new farm, there is uh, a thousand acre, uh, that 1,000 acres of timber, right at 1,000 acres of timber on the uh, west side, and on the east side is about 400 acres of timber. So we've got a really big area of thicket. So when the deer go to moving around, when people go to cutting crops and things like that, I feel like we're going to attract a lot of deer, especially with all the CRP, with all the food we're putting on. We got So we've got cover, water, food. Um, I think we're going to be able to cut some timber 
off yeah. of this one uh, is what uh, our guy up there told us. So we may be able to even deer it up in the woods a little more. And it's just, it is a really cool farm. And the game plan for this farm was the basically the same game plan as the other farm. We're going to take it in a couple of years, take it out of CRP, put it back in the crops, and um, you know just keep the cycle going. Uh, and we're not in a hurry. Yeah. Uh, I think this is going to be a super fun project. I know both of our wives are excited. This camp is a little nicer than our older camp, so we can get the wives up there. It's got a five acre and a four acre lake with some fish in it. Um, Bring the kids up, go fishing. I mean, it's going to be a good time. It's it, it's a good farm, and and you know people listen out of um, you know South Louisiana, where a lot of our listeners are from. They buy land from us up here. Well, Slate, y'all live up there in Paradise. You're right. You're, we, we live in a cool spot, and we do all these things up here. But you know, we go to the Midwest to hunt. We go up there to hunt that <coughs> that rut, and then we come down here and hunt this rut. And we're blessed to be able to do that. But uh, it's a different ball game up there. For me to tell yeah. you, Southwest Mississippi can compete with up there. I'd be lying to you. No. I mean, we're yeah. 15 miles from the Iowa line. Uh, those deer up there. 250 275 pounds I and mean, when you see a big one he's a big, a big one. he's a big one when he steps out you know it just like when banana bob stepped out he would no mistake in him so he knew i never i'll never forget the text message <laughs> uh I, and it was a little confusing so ryan so it was funny we had a big deer the 167 ryan killed on our leash just north of there called banana bob we've been watching him for two years i had a really good encounter with him but bob didn't really live on us no. He would leave us during the rut. He lived right. in, in the off season. I mean, in the uh, early season, off season, he'd live on us. And so the big deer, or the big eight, I killed. It was our target buck at the time. I went up there and killed him. Ryan went the next week, and Bob was nowhere to be found. And the night before they got up there, my cell camera went off. Boom! There was Bob. He was back on the farm. And if y'all know anything about bear cub. <laughs> He's negative Nancy. Negative Nancy, so he did. Not, he wanted to go hunt the very far west side of the farm, and we moved a, a box stand over there to where we could see this huge draw. And uh, he said, "All right, let's get a plan together for in the morning." I said, "Well, I said I think we're gonna go over here and hunt on the north side." Oh man, he was so negative about mm -hmm. that. And look, when it broke daylight, uh, there was actually some public hunting right next to it, and I seen the guy walking around down there. And uh, of course, negative Nancy Bear Cub, he's like, oh man, I can't believe we're up here. We're hunting next to this public land and stuff, and everybody on top of us. And uh, anyway, we were sitting there, and I had a doe or a little yearling feeding off on the right, on the backwoods plot over there. And I looked, I'll never forget it, and I seen that there was a spike come out. And when I looked behind him, there was a banana bottom trailing right behind the spike. Out of all things, a spike. And uh, anyway, once we killed him and stuff, I told Bear Cub, I said, see there, I tried to tell you, he's just, you know, I, he's, he's, I, I just, I would have never, ever come over here on this side of the farm. I said, well, this is where we get pictures of him at. Why wouldn't you hunt there? Right. And, and like, going back to what Ryan said, when you see a big one up there, it ain't no doubt. I've never read right. the text message. The text message I got was, Bob is dead. <laughs> and so I was like, did the neighbor kill Bob? Yeah. Or, and I was, you know, of course, they got their phones on silent. They're doing TV and stuff like that. So it was 30 minutes before I found out they had killed That's Bob. That's right. But uh, that was a giant deer, Ryan's best deer. I actually had a little bit broke off. The deer would have gross moon. Mm -hmm. He would have been 170. And, and that's what this area, that's why we go up there. You know, I mean, look, you know, chances are we'll be hunting... 140 to 160 inch deer. But right. if we get a picture of a 200, it's not... It, that's right it's, it's not doable. A, yeah it's exactly right i mean it's, it's you won't be surprised i mean you will be surprised you know if you get a 200 but because that's the goal or whatever mm -hmm. everybody's kind of you know looking for or whatnot in the whitetail world but i mean it, it's possible it's very possible and they had a picture on this place of a deer they killed they didn't have a very good picture but deer looked 190. oh yeah I mean, absolutely a giant, giant, giant deer giant deer and uh so i, I mean every place we've gotten up there we've got a picture of a 160 plus yeah oh, every yeah. place so it i mean and, and you know you can you know i got i got cameras all over southwest mississippi and i'll tell you how i can count on one hand how many pictures of deer over 140 i've got yeah. you know very, I mean, you very few very, very few. few i get someone i get someone dixon creek actually which actually went under contract this week deal uh it um 
I've gotten some 150s on camera out there, but uh, you know, most of the time we're hunting around here, 120 to 140 inch deer and happy to do it. And look, Ryan a little more selective than I am, but like if I go up on this place and a five year old 140 inch deer in Northern Missouri walks by me on September 15th, he's, on that day, he's a, I'll be waiting on, <laughs> I'll be going to hunt somewhere yeah. else and be a happy little camper. Mm -hmm. Something I'm looking on on X and something, you know, we've just learned Ryan pointed it out it, 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 over on the east side of that um, of the farm. There's some nasty stuff, and we know what that nasty looks like because we've looked at so much on X and aerial photographs over the years. And that little area like that just holds so many deer. So I've got a lot, of, a lot of little food plots already drawn out on here. Now this will 100% change once we get yeah. up there. But this is why I got written on my pad here of things to talk about for this podcast is the enjoyment of the project. <clears throat> I mean, to me, there. Every time I leave, I'm like, ah, I want to get back up there. You actually wonder every time you go up there why you don't live up there. Yeah, I know it. I know it. I mean, as a kid growing up, I mean, I always dreamed of, of you know, owning a piece of property in Missouri. I never thought it would happen, but uh, yeah, when when you go up there and hunt and you spend your time and you got a place to put all your stuff, keep everything, and you're putting your efforts in the property that you own, it, it's hard to come back here. It really is. And, and going back to the enjoyment, I I mean, I have just as much fun when we go and plant food plots and stuff as we do at hunt, just the, the plan and then getting the deer on camera and you learn every time you do it. You know, it's, I guess, you know, they talk about the cycles of the white tail, mm -hmm. you know, of the hunter in general. And, you know, uh, you know, you first you just want to kill and Of course, I still just, I want to kill. But yeah. at, at the same time, like doing it on a piece of ground that you own and then the, you know, and ain't nobody can come over there and tell you doing this wrong or not. Exactly do it, right. do it just like you want to. Um, you're not bowing down to any landowner saying, you know, hey, don't put your food plot here, don't you? Mm -hmm. You know, as long as you're within legal regulations, you we can do it here. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm super excited about it. such a beautiful area. I can't wait to get up there. We are going to go the last week of April, and uh, we'll probably. Um, throughout the year, you know, do a couple of updates as far as this project, and we'll be filming an episode about when we're going up there. I think we'll make two trips this spring, early summer, as far as planning, and then, like I said, we'll go up late July, August, depending on the weather, and uh, and do our, our green food plots. But man, I can't wait. It, it's so cool because what we do on this farm, we you know, in the eastern part of the state, we couldn't do this, but on this farm, uh, we can put out salt blocks and things. Yeah. And so, by the time we get back up there in late July, August, I mean, we'll pretty much have a pretty good inventory of deer. That's exactly right, man. And, and it's just amazing what minerals will do, you know, as far as attracting deer in. Uh, growing up down here, I mean, you'd throw a salt block out, but well, heck, back then we didn't have cameras mm -hmm. to put out. But, I mean, you can put a, a mineral site up there and put a camera on it and then you'll know i mean what deer are in the area you'll have them on camera there and then you can start building a plan to kill that deer once deer season opens up yep yep because they you know they they typically you know what they're doing in late july until maybe the last week of october for the most part um you know ours is crp so we're not dealing with cutting crops or anything but for the most part right. they'll be in those areas or they will freak with those areas sometime throughout correct. the fall correct um ryan something i want to get back uh you know, touch back on how did you get comfortable? I know how I did, but I'm at, and will ask you how did you get comfortable with? Okay, I'm gonna invest in land up here. Okay, I'm gonna pull the trigger. Talk about where you, you know, because I, I know this, but tell our audience, you know, you pulled some money out of a different account yeah. retirement that you're planning, and kind of you yeah. still got you still got your investment right. you just put in a different place. Yeah. So with the COVID, uh, I was able to move some money around that I had from previ a previous job. And, you know, that's honestly the only way that I was able to get this. Uh, I was able to do that, move the money, use that as a down payment to take care of that. Uh, as far as getting comfortable doing that, I, I know that when I put my money in the land, it's going to be there. You know, obviously i got to make the interest payments on it, mm -hmm. but it's going to be there. Uh, the money that I had in the stock market, I had just watched, I had lost a huge amount you know, that was in this annuity that I had. Uh, and I let it come back up some, and then I went on and pulled it out, and that's when I put it into the property. But it's just the safety 
the safety net. Yeah, you may not just have a huge home run, but it's a safety net. That property is always going to be there. You're going to have that. If it takes 10 years, or if we ever, if we decide, hey, this is one we want to keep, you know, I've got that and, and my money's set. Mm -hmm. Versus being out there and, you know, in what I call fantasy world, you don't know where your money's at. Numbers on a computer screen. That's exactly right. So it's just, just a safety deal. Uh, and, and you're seeing it, I'm seeing it. A lot of people are moving their money in the land. You know, it's just, that's, it, it's safe. It's just a safe investment. Now, you can make some bad investments on, on property. That's why you got to be very familiar with the market, and which I think we're making a really, really good investment on this property. Uh, you know, two years from now, it's going to come out of CRP. We'll be able to put it in crops. It's going to be a more tractable form to someone that's looking for that. So, Yeah, it's actually going to go up about 30 to 40 percent in our uh, net return every year because right. of uh, uh, you know how much more we can get as long as commodity prices stay good yeah. and uh back to what ryan was saying you know it's the safety net deal is look land prices can come up or come down you know that property's not going anywhere they're not making any more of it and i've never caught a fish or killed a deer or killed a turkey on my a stock a portfolio, portfolio. And, and that's what we like to do and you know some people aren't comfortable with land ryan said of course you can make bad investments and this goes for any property, anybody that buys and sells any type of real estate, you make your money on the buy. Correct. You can't just go, oh, I bought a farm, I got a great yeah. investment. Not if you didn't buy the right farm with the right plan. Um, <clears throat> so you got, you know, you got to buy right, and uh, you know, you get something you're comfortable with, and get a, get a game plan. You know, we've been up there, and we've got kind of a game plan. I know Ryan and I both, uh, we invest a lot here locally in land. Ryan's got some good investments he does with himself and his brother. Uh, has been part of helping some other people invest in some land and working on some. Me and him are actually working on with the same client right now, investing in, in some big tracks. So, you know, I love investing down here, but that project, it got that snowball effect, that, that, that money rolling up there and plan on keeping it up there. I enjoy the project. I'm comfortable with it, and that's a good market up there. You know, you yes. uh, you don't just go buy every land deal that comes out there. You you got to buy the right ones that make sense. And we bought the first right one that made sense. We didn't know what we were going to buy when we accepted our offer on our place. But we found a place. We even toyed with the idea of moving the money back down here if we couldn't find the right deal. But thank the good Lord, we did find the right deal. And. Uh, can't wait to get up there and, and uh, look at all of our chainsaws and rakes and land. Our investment, what's going to happen, we'll get up there and see stuff that we want to keep. Oh, yeah. 100%. 100%. I've, been, I've got a big old tree down on one of the places I hunt down the road. I'm thinking, how big the bar on those chainsaws yeah. is. Just, <laughs> just like I had texted you to tell you that Carlos said, don't even think about bringing that tractor mm -hmm. home. You know? Oh, that tractor, it, look, it looks mighty good. Yeah. But uh, I'm excited because every time we go up there, on you know, and look, don't think that Ryan, oh, Ryan and I, TV show guys, look, yeah. every year we've gone up there, we've borrowed tractors, we've paid people to do this, we've yeah. hand seeded, we've done with a four wheeler. Like, we poor boy food plot this thing to death. Whatever we had to do to get it done, and, and we it, did it. And it's it's worked out. Uh, it's worked out. And, um, you know, we're, I'm super excited because we don't have to move our blinds off our old lease because the guy who bought the farm, um, he, uh, you know, he's buying the stands too. Something interesting, um, you know, people talk about, oh man, somebody bought my lease and they cut my timber on my lease. This happens to everybody. Ryan and I have had two leases in the past three years and guess what? They both got sold. Yep. And I tell people all the time, hey man, I hate that, but buy you some land like Ryan and I are doing yep. and you don't have to worry about that. And I know not everybody can afford to buy land and things like that, but with interest rates that Southern Ag Credit and other banks have right now, if there's ever been a time to invest in land, it's good right now, which is shockingly that we were able to find a good deal on a farm up there because right. uh, inventory's low everywhere. It's, it, it's happening up there and it's happening down here. Stuff that has not been selling in years all of a sudden is selling because inventory's low, interest rates are good, and no matter what's happening in Washington, the land market still continues to do good and look 
you know, we ain't getting into politics on here, but I know that everybody listening to this podcast cannot stand what's going on in the cities and in Washington and yes. the COVID and the mask and the vaccine, whatever. You Everything. Name it, the, the, just everybody, I mean, it's just overwhelming what, what's going on. Let me tell you what's not going to happen in on any of the land I own. Nobody's going to call me a racist on, on my place That's or right. anywhere I own. We're just going to live life. At, at, yeah, like, we'll enjoy it just like we do down here. I mean, you know, we're going to go up there. We're going to enjoy our time. It's what we like to do. We like to go to the Midwest and chase the big buck. I mean, when you go up there, not only deer hunting, turkey hunting also, but you see things in the hunting world that you don't get to see. That you dream about. That, that's exactly right. I mean, I'd love to see a big buck chasing, uh, you know, two or three does around out here in my food plot. It just don't happen like that. And a lot of it's got to do with hunting pressure, you know, and, and the more um, hunting gets bigger and bigger up there, the people are learning, you know, that, hey, we got really good deer. You know, if we let this deer go, we're gonna kill, you know, we might kill a big deer. And so anyway, it's just, and, and something, you know, we talk about how much we learn down here and we apply up there. I've got a backwards thing. Shockingly, I've learned things up there because you see so much more of the rut and things. Yes. For one, one instance, scrape trees. All right, Ryan and I started doing scrape trees uh, up there. You know, we'd cut a little old tree down and we were both shocked at how good they <laughs> They work so good that the deer would have a scrape in a whole circle because right? they would hook the tree and then hook it all the way around in a hole. And, uh, and it works down here. So I brought yes. that same uh, plan and uh, it didn't take any time. i tell you just a little tip uh, that I learned down here is you can take a cedar tree, you know, big around your leg and plant it with some post hole diggers. And man, look, they first of all, they love to rub the cedar tree. Absolutely. The cedar tree, will, if you have a wet fall like we did this year, they kind of stay alive yep. and they love to scrape under them. And it's a really cool place to put your trail camera. A lot of these places, like in Missouri, you cannot bait. Correct. Um, so at a place you can't bait, you know, you either got to put a fence graph or a trail or a food plot. Well, let me, in the middle of these food plots, those scrape trees, they work. Okay. So it's, it's a really cool thing. And, um, you know, so it's something that I learned up there to apply down here. And, and you know, we talk about the hunting pressure. We've been, I, I turkeys, like I said, been whipping me. Look, when we go up there, sometimes it's harder than others. But you can, we're going to kill some turkeys. Yeah. Well, it's just, I mean, you're going to hear turkeys. You know, turkeys. You see down, turkeys. You see turkeys. You hear turkeys. Here, there may be a turkey there, but he may not be gobbling. Mm -hmm. And he may not gobble all season, but he's going to gobble up there. I right. mean, it's just the way it is. It's a different breed of turkeys, you know, and uh, just a, they're crazy, you know. You get up there and you get after those big 26, 27 pound turkeys, and I mean, look like a 55 gallon drum when he comes over the hill struck. And when it's cold, when it's a 30 degree morning up there mm -hmm. and a 26 pound gobbler gobbles on. Oh, yeah. He's got the steam rolling off of him oh, when he yeah. gobbles, that's yeah. for sure. And it's fun, and they got the big old turks. I actually killed one uh, 15 miles north of here in Iowa, and when I got into the scale, he weighed 30 point like two pounds, and I said, "Oh, that scale's wrong." And I tested it, and that scale was right. And I remember thinking, coming out the woods, I said, "Man, this is the biggest turkey ever. Yeah, I'd be 25, 26 pounds, end up being 30." So they got not only giant deer, yes. they got uh, they got giant turkeys too. It's just it, it's fun up there. Um, you know, we're kind of getting to the time. We like to, to narrow this thing down. And I, last episode, I had just me on here, but today I've got Ryan. So I get to ask Ryan the $100 million question. All right, as we do with every one of our guests, uh, <clears throat> and this is going to be interesting because we're kind of doing some of this up in the Midwest already, but Ryan, tomorrow you go to Greensburg to the store and you buy a lottery ticket and you win a $100 million net. Where are we buying land and why? Just talk me through that. Do I get multiple places? Hundred million. You can do whatever you want. Oh man, that's that's an easy easy deal. First off, uh, I would try to build some more property around my home base, right there around my house. I, that's just always been a dream of mine. And then second, I would take all my money and I give to Missouri, right there where our place is at. You know, uh, just that's that's what I like. That's where I like to be. I love it up there. One day when I retire, uh, hopefully we got us a big place and spend a lot of time up there. Take my kids by then, maybe have grandkids, you know, and uh, 
just just do things that my dad wanted to do you know and we just we didn't have the way and the means of doing it you know and uh just want to leave that just like they told me growing up you want to leave your kids better than what they were left you know you want to do better for your kids so anyway that's just what i want to do but yeah i could uh you know i talk to my wife about that all the time oh if we won the lottery what would we do and stuff and uh, i told her i said it would take me long i could spend it all and she said seriously i said oh yeah i said you know how much hunting property i have <laughs> so I'm saying you know i mean you say that but yeah that would be what i would do i'd build around my home there you know i'd love to have eventually one day i'd love to have a thousand acres down here you know uh, but if you had 100 million, we could probably make that happen. I'll, I guarantee I'll be your agent. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. I could, we could make it happen, that's for sure. So, but yeah, uh, Missouri, the Midwest up there, if, you, if you've never been, it's just even in the fall, the fall leaves and stuff, you don't get to see that here, you know, and it's just a, it's beautiful up there. Enjoy it. Uh, and you can, you can make some really good investments. And like I say, we did on the first one. and. This one here, I believe, is just as good or better. So Ryan, if you heard, Ryan is investing in land around here, and he's buying stuff in northern Missouri. So Ryan really isn't changing anything. He's just got a bigger bank to do it with. Um, and, I, and I can answer this. He didn't say it, but he would probably, if, on his place in Missouri, he'd have something in Iowa, too. Yeah, yeah. It just is hard to get a tag there. And that's another reason why we, you know, focus on Missouri. And we're in northern Missouri, right by Iowa, which I would consider Iowa and, and Kansas uh, the best two states to hunt in. Now, Kansas, I've got a good spot to hunt, and but you only get one tag in Kansas. Correct. In Missouri, as a landowner, I think you can get three tags. Not sure. I know we get two. Yeah, yeah we, we get two, no you, doubt. You, I think you used to get three. Oh, we'll, have to, we'll have to double check on that. We might have to scrounge up another tag. That's right. But, I, you know, we've never actually gone up. It's such a tough time to go up there for the muzzleloader season after Christmas. It's like the 26th. Uh, it's right there in the Christmas holidays. Is, I think it's the uh, maybe the 20s. Maybe it starts right before Christmas. I can't remember. I've never made it there. You know, now I've been after January. January, I think it goes to the 10th, mm -hmm. January 10th, and during both seasons, it's been the coldest weather I've hunted in. Oh, yeah. You yeah. Did. It was negative 10 that time, DePines and I was uh, there in Missouri. And, you know, but hey, that's when the big deer get up and move. You can get them going. So, yeah, and, uh, and if you got the food like Ryan and I plan on having, um, you know, and, and we've gotten spoiled to these bow hunting box blinds, you can get away with cold weather, you know. <laughs> We're wimps hunting from used to living down here to hunting up there in cold weather and the scent. Yeah. Well, the a lot of it though is uh, if it's 25 degrees out there and you got a 15, 10, 15 mile an hour wind and it blows 10 to 15 up there all Every the time. Day. And at 20, 25 degrees outside, that's no fun. You, I mean, you you can sit there in the lock on for two or three hours and you're freezing to death. You can get inside one of those blinds, keep the wind off of you. You can hunt comfortable and hunt all day. Mm -hmm. And it really does make it a lot more comfortable. And something that, that's huge up there is the lack of trees. Yes. yes. So so you can, you know, with a bow hunting box blind, which, it, you know, you can hunt anywhere. You move it, and it's going to shock everybody from the south. Listen to this. Look, you can move those box blinds up there and the next day hunt them, and yeah. it don't bother them. Not one bit. Mariko was laughing earlier when we were riding around, and somebody had just put up a box in, a cutover place we rode by, he says, we're done to be putting up a box in. I said, well, you got to put them up now, so that's spooked from them from That's next exactly season. right. That's not the case up no. there. You can move them around on trailers and, and pop up a blind, you know, with the corn. You can tuck blinds back in the corn if the wind changes. It's just the things you can't do with these wild creatures down here, you can do up there, and it just makes it real fun. Well, we're going uh, to end this thing where this is the Missouri Project episode, and I think y'all we really took y'all through our plan, and as we continue this podcast, we'll take y'all through how it's going. Um, it's a really fun project, and it's been really a, a good blessing for us. We've, we've done good on our project, and we've only been, we've been into it less than a year now, so we'll update y'all after we go see the new property and tell y'all how good it is, and uh, heck, by the time we update y'all online, I'm going to have a... Little boy Rafe Slade is going to be here, Lori and I's new baby. So that's one thing about this Missouri project is if uh, my little boys and, and girls like to hunt and Ryan's little girls like to hunt like we do, 
it's going to be really cool to be able to take them on something that that we've developed and know when we put them in that bow hunting box blind, they will probably get a shot. Absolutely, and and enjoy it. You know, that's the biggest thing. Uh, certain areas, uh, especially when you cross the state line and get down my way, you got St. Linda Parish, Tanspo Parish. There's a lot of areas that you can go and go and go, and you might hunt seven, eight days and not see a deer. Mm -hmm. You go up there, you're gonna see deer. You're gonna have a good chance at a, at a nice buck if you're patient. You know. And uh, then the turkey hunting is just unreal. Right, right. You spoil somebody up there turkey quick, hunting. Quick, quick. It, it is really fun. We always say we turkey hunt down here and then we go get even up there. That's exactly right. Well, Ryan, thank you for coming on. Good luck. Thank turkey you for having this me. Afternoon. I'm going to call, I'm going to go predict something right here. Ryan and Bear Club are going to kill another turkey because they're going <laughs> to give me all kinds of heck because I've been having some. It's weird how they'll humble you sometimes. And I told Luke the problem was. He gave us bad juju opening the yeah, 100%. He, he moved. He run the turkey off. I, I watched the video. 100% cameraman fault. Well, he even said it. He said, yeah, I spoke to him. Yeah. And, and, but see, it doesn't even bother him. You know, like, oh, because see, that's the way it is. Up there, you just go get on another turkey. Here, it might ruin your whole season. I yelled at that turkey this morning. And then got him. <laughs> I mean, I'm serious. All right, well, we're going to uh, end this thing. Ryan, good luck this afternoon. Yep. Thank you all for listening. Thank you for Southern Ag Credit for helping putting this thing on and help us invest in the Missouri Project. So exactly. we are practicing what we're preaching. So uh, good luck and God bless, and we'll talk to you all in about two weeks.